So the framework is this. Let's go through a planning process that you see here in block one. So there are three rows here. And the first one is the planning process that I've talked about. And it's about forecasting your future. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Impact Income and Influence, the number one show for monetization strategy on the internet. My name's Steve Warner. I'll be your host today. And I'm joined by Minders Glover. Minders is a great friend of mine. We kind of came up together and we got to see each other do a lot of cool things. He is a launch strategist. He helps companies get their digital footprint going, helps them with a launch model, and he he has a mind for strategy, frameworks, mind maps that is more, it's like off the charts is how good it is. Minders, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Steve. I'm glad to be here. So tell us about kind of how all this started for you, because you have a very, very background. You've done a lot of really super interesting things, but how did you get to the launch part of this? Well, you know, all of my adult life, I've been an entrepreneur and I only worked for someone else long enough to get my CPA certificate. That was the work requirement to becoming a CPA. And, and, uh, um, and I had enough of it to realize that, you know, I wanted to be working for myself and, and apply my creativity. So that's been my whole realm of experience. And, and I've probably had about eight different startups in uh, a like number of industries, but the common thread that has run through a lot of the things that I've been doing either directly or in the background is the real estate investing area. So my story really begins in earnest years ago in my small town of Durango, Colorado, where I, you know, I took a look at where I was going and I said, you know, I've invested in single family homes and in duplexes and even with a partner in a 17 unit complex. But to reach the pinnacle of my profession, I saw it as being a real estate developer. But there was a gap in my experience. And it was like, well, how do I get to do that when I've only invested in in up to complexes. And so the obvious answer is align yourself with a partner, you know, a developer, someone who has that expertise. So that's exactly what I did. And I found a partner in, in uh, Durango, Colorado, uh, who is a developer. And together we found this property for sale right on the riverfront. I mean, this is a, you've been there. It's mm -hmm. a resort town with a rafting and world-class fly fishing river uh, and the mountains nearby and a great ski resort and very little development on the river um, other than warehouses and parking lots and things like that. So we had an opportunity to go there and to, and to seize on that. So that's how it initially started. Wow. So, I mean, you, you started off, well, first off, like, like so many entrepreneurs, we work for somebody else for a little bit and we're like, this is definitely not for me. Like we're the ones who are like, you know, you know how I can always tell the entrepreneurs when I, when I worked, when I was a manager, the people who showed up early, wanted to stay late and were trying to make the job better. I was like, these guys are going to run their own business. They're going to do something for themselves because they don't have an employee mindset. So you got your CPA license. You started investing in real estate, which is great. I mean, that's a great way to build some passive income. And then you were like, how do I better this? I have, to be a, I have to become a real estate developer. So you found somebody to partner with. How does that lead to launching businesses and doing a launch strategy for somebody? Because that's a, that's a pretty big pivot. And I know this didn't happen overnight. So tell us about how you invested in real estate. You started with the riverfront property in Durango, which is gorgeous. What happened from there? So we undertook a three-year process to get you know, all of the engineering done and go through city council and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we had, uh, I had $200,000 into it, my partner an equivalent amount. We borrowed uh, $2 million, you know, to, so we had, 
Well, we had a total of like two, two and a half million dollars in capital in this project. And then uh, our project was 37 condos. It was like I'd been through every unit inch by inch in the planning process. And we were lining up pre-sales for our project, had sold half of them, you know, at about a million dollars each uh, in terms of commitments. We even had lenders standing in line to secure us for the construction loan. You know, this would have been a $40 million project and a $5 million uh, payday uh, for, for me at the end. But then the collapse of 2008 happened. And so all of the, the bottom fell right out of that. And so, I mean, literally overnight, it was like, you know, no personal guarantee loan required for the construction loan we were about to get to now we couldn't get anybody, you know, to give us a loan, much less uh, to keep their commitments to buy the condo. So what I learned in, in this process was uh, that I, I just had to stop swinging for the bleachers. And this is a critical component of how I got into the online world. And so keep that concept in mind about, you know, rather than swinging for the bleachers, trying to make a home run, let's go for singles along the way. Now, there is a little bit of a side story here in that um, I did come out from this thing unscathed, except that I lost that investment. I mean, that was a huge investment to lose, but being personally guaranteed on the underlying loan and with a partner facing bankruptcy, I was about to go bankrupt myself. And then lesson number two came into play, and that was be sure to treat the people around you well, and, and it'll all come out fine for you. And so the way that that happened was that we had secured a private investor who was behind the bank. And because we treated him well and keeping him informed and not letting the bank force him into a position that would have been detrimental, he remembered that. And when he had the opportunity to buy out our underlying loan, he bailed us out in the process uh, so that so that uh, we didn't go under with the project. So those were two key turning point lessons. Number one, don't swing for the bleachers. And number two, you know, take care of people that you're associated with in the process. That, I mean, those are two really good lessons. Like it's, it's funny, this is the second time that how you treat people has come up today. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Like I've, when I go on a first date with somebody, I always watch to see how they treat the waitress, waiter. I always look at other people to see how they treat the people that work under them. If we're on a call with somebody and their assistants on looking to see how they treat their assistant, how their employees like working for them. Because if, if any of that is bad, they're regardless of how much money they make, they're not a good person. They're not going to be good to work with. They're not, they're going to treat you the same way they treat the other people around them. Right. Um, so that is a huge lesson. And that came back. I've found the same thing. You never know. I can't tell you the number of people that have come up to me that I did something for or had a random conversation with over the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. I had, I had somebody the other day come back to me like four and a half years ago, they reached out on Facebook and something I had completely forgotten about. And they, they were like, thank you so much. Like this really affected my life. What can I do to help you? Like that stuff is, is priceless in the amount in the way like the karma i guess would be the right word um so talk to me about not swinging for the fences because i feel like that unfortunately is what attracts a lot of people to digital marketing online business is the biz op like oh i'm gonna quit my job i'm gonna be a millionaire in three months or i'm gonna quit my job and i'm gonna make twenty thousand dollars a month right out the gates um what like talk to me about not swinging for the fences because it sounds like moving up to that point you had you had done very reasonable right single family double family triplex worked your way up to 17 units and then the next thing is well 
let's do an actual development. So I can't fault your, your path to where you got. So what, talk to me about swinging for the fences and what your framework around that would be, or maybe it's just making sure you get enough singles along the way. Um, well, that's exactly it. It's all about getting enough singles along the way. Uh, and then you have consistent growth. And, and that will play very much into some of the lessons that I want to share with the group here today. But, but the idea here is think about entrepreneurship, you know, as, as the terms uh, underlying themes imply is that uh, you want to take some significant moves or willing to take risks and get ahead more quickly than in traditional ways. And so that's what um, what the, you know, a huge development is all about. It has inherent risks. And these were very calculated risks. Uh, it's just that we didn't know that 2008 was coming up on the horizon, you know. And, uh, and so even though this was a sound project, um, you know, it, it had other things that undermined it. And so what I mean by learning not to swing for the bleachers is let's look at at something you can do uh, that matches with your skill set and your interests and your personal values, like treating other people well, and that you can sustain over the long term. So you take bite sized uh, chunks along the way and let them build on each other. Um, in order to reach success. So, so what I did was I said, all right, what am I going to do um, in order to, you know, start that path of, of let's take, you know, bite-sized chunks and, and hit singles, if you will. And so what I decided to do was to start with online marketing. And that started in 2008, right after that other experience ended. Now, I had... Uh, the benefit of of having some nice role models, um, including a neighbor, four houses down for seven years by the name of Jeff Walker, and you and I have had this discussion. And you know he created the whole uh, uh, you know original product launch methodology, and and I had taken his course and been a part of of uh, that community on the periphery and had many discussions with Jeff along it, along that line. And so I started to apply it for myself. And uh, as law of attraction would have it, um, I sourced an experience, a joint venture with an internet marketer, um, uh, Don Crowther, who had, uh, I was doing a program related to Camtasia with my wife, Deb, on offering training on how to use that video making software. And Don had, uh, had a, a related interest in that software. And we joint ventured on a process for about a year and, uh, and did that until the technology changed for Camtasia and, um, and our training wasn't directly relevant and we decided to go in different directions. But what happened was about a year and a half later, he approached me to help him out on his launch in the social media space. And um, he actually needed a project manager, which is one of my skill sets. And I came on about three weeks before that launch went public and, uh, and helped him organize it uh, in, you know, find what the programmers were talking about, find out what the, the people who were doing the social media were talking about, you know, and so that everything would come together and that the launch would happen on time. So a lot of right brain people needing a left brain guidance uh, from my standpoint. And, and um, I got hooked in the whole product launch arena and that set some things into motion that uh, put my trajectory into my core skill set today, which is product launch consulting. That's, I mean, that is pretty awesome. Um, I want to, there's a lot in there that I want to unpack. Um, let's, I want to 
pause that though. And I want to step inside of something because I feel like entrepreneurs, we're used to having up, downs, up, downs, up, downs, peaks, valleys, lots of money in the bank, no money in the bank. What are we doing? But I think some people listening to this, if they're new to the space or if they're safe in their corporate job and they're looking at being an entrepreneur, how did you, I, I want to see if you'll, you're willing to share with us, like what happened when that real estate venture went south? Because I like at the time I was actually in my corporate job. So I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was actually glad I had sold my business three years prior. Um, but how did you handle that? Like, because it did happen pretty much overnight. Like within a couple of weeks, property values went from millions of dollars to nothing. You lost the ability to get loans. Stuff is melting down. Like, how did you handle that? And how did you recover so quickly? What were some of the things that you did in your head to keep yourself? Because I mean, if you're facing bankruptcy, that especially from, I just made a $200,000 investment. I've got numerous rental properties. I think I'm set. I mean, you probably... If six months earlier, if somebody would have said you're going to be bankrupt six months from now, you would have laughed. Sure. Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, that, that is an excellent question. And, um, you know, so what happens is you reach a point. So, so what was going to cause the bankruptcy? That's the important thing. What was going to cause the bankruptcy is that we had a million and a half dollars in loans with a personal guarantee uh, that either they could come after either me or my partner and my partner was already going south for sure. So they were going to come after me and, um, and you look at that and you say, okay, you know, um, wow, this thing is real. I, you know, what can I do to, to minimize this and the way and the path downward was um, the bank is saying, you know, we're going to take appraisals every three months. And if the value has decreased, you have to increase a 20% investment to keep the, you know, the, the 20% uh, equity to, to total value ratio, right. And so I researched it and realized that values were going to complete, continue to go down and my investment, more money after bad was going to have to go up. And so, so I, I, I went to my attorney in, in Denver and I said, you know, I am standing alone here. I need, my partner doesn't support me anymore because, you know, he's already going south and I need you guys to have my back because I am going to go into the bank and tell them I will not renew the loan. So the thing was, we had an underlying property that we that was producing rental income to cover the the cash flow of the loan, but we hadn't torn it down yet. And the bank wanted to increase the interest rate to the point where we couldn't, you know, make the make loan. Sense. Right. And so we said, all you need to do is give us the uh, the same interest rate, you know, that we have now, and we can continue to make this work. And they said, nope, we won't do it. So with the moral support of my wife, Deb, I, uh, you know, which was incredible, because I had to become completely humble, there was no place to hide. And I realized that hiding, running away was not an option. So I got her support, I got my attorney support, I got the second lender support, because mm -hmm. I told him, I will not put you in a situation where you have to put up more equity to cover these, you know, declining equity values. So I'm going to go into the office of the bank, uh, where the bank president for the whole bank in the state of Colorado was there and stand alone and say, let the buck stop here, you know, but I will not renew this loan. And so I did that. And so the, the strength that you get when you make a decision like that is absolutely amazing, you know, but holding the space, holding the space of integrity, uh, the bank then proceeded to go out to something that was called 
vulture capitalists. And I, I still laugh when I think of that term. It was like they'll go, to, they'll go to investors who will buy the loan from the bank at a deep discount. Then they own the investor, the, you know, the equity person, and then they go and pick the bones, find where they can get their asset. You know? And mm-hmm. it was like, all right, man, that's the beginning of the end. I am doomed. And as, as circumstance would have it, uh, no one, no vulture capitalist took them up on the offer before they had to get the loan off the books before year end. And so they went back to my second, in, you know, my private lender. And not only did they give him the interest rate that they wouldn't give me, they, they dropped uh, a deep discount by 50% the value of the loan. And so That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, isn't that in crazy? You know, we could have done the deal if they had come back with half of that, but but they didn't. And so all I had, you know, was I had to make a new relationship with money. It's like, okay, I lost a big chunk of change, but, you know, I've got other resources and I've got plenty of time in my life left to go and rebuild. And so uh, that's when I made that decision. The best place to start rebuilding you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, was online marketing to take my expertise and bring it online. Awesome. I mean, that's, I think the, the resiliency that entrepreneurs have, cause we've all, we've all had our backs against the wall. I mean, that's kind of where we do our best work sometimes. Um, that's where great ideas come from. So it's, it's interesting to see that. It's nice that you, you definitely talked about your wife and how she supported you, um, I mean, I'm sure there were some sleepless nights and some rough mornings. Oh, and, unbelievable. Yeah. But you made it through. And so, okay, you made it to the launch strategy. You started doing this launch for, so I want to touch on this too, in case you guys missed it. You partnered with this guy doing the Camtasia stuff, doing Camtasia training. Because you treated him correctly, even though that business, you guys separated and went different directions, he came back to you later because he knew that he liked you. He knew that he could trust you and he knew that you would do what you said you were going to do. So he then hired you as a launch strategist. Talk to me a little bit about the results that you got for him and how that went, because this is before launching was a big thing. This is what, this was like 2009, 2010. Um, Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Uh, how'd that go? So, well, it went, it went great. Um, And, you know, the interesting thing was, um, back then, I, uh, the big thing in launches was to end your seven day launch with, uh, a, like a marathon, a six to eight hour marathon session, you know? And so, uh, we would go for this launch. We went to a studio in San Diego um, and had a professional film crew in with cameras in multiple directions and did a marathon. And, you know, and so he, uh, Don brought in, you know, Jeff Walker and Andy Jenkins and all kinds of big names, wow. you know, that were on, uh, on this um, event. And um, at the end of it, uh, with the cameras rolling and these, you know, these, this, great equipment. He gave me a, a live testimonial, a video testimonial that I have, which was unbelievable. He looked into the camera and he and first looked at me over here. I was sitting next to him. And then he looked into the camera and said, Minders, with three weeks to go before this launch, uh, behind the scenes, it was doomed. We the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. We brought you in to make sense of this and you corralled the team and orchestrated everything coming together so that uh, this came to fruition. And without you, these were his magic words, without you, this launch would have never happened. And it was like, whoa, I love it. And I have it on film, right? So so um, it was it was great and it was enlivening and uh, some things started to come together which shaped my approach to product launches which make it totally different to the way that anyone else is is helping consult with out there in the marketplace 
that's awesome. Like that is, I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with you. You're a good friend of mine. Anyone who's listening to this, like Miter's mind maps break things down that you didn't even know that you were thinking about that you said, and he lays it out in a really good framework and he's great at managing people. So let's shift the conversation a little bit and tell us if somebody comes to talk to you, I know you have a challenge where you take people through kind of the beginning stages of doing a launch. What are like you have this framework that you put people through. You can share the framework with us, but then tell us like what's one, two, three things that people should be looking at, thinking about, know about doing a launch because you have some pretty revolutionary thoughts around launches. I know a lot of people think that it's just the Jeff Walker style, but walk us through like what's, how does this get started? Do you need a lot of experience? Do you even need a product to do a launch? Uh Great questions, and I'm going to try to cover each of those in kind. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the three aspects of the framework. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to tell you how I came to that from these experiences that I talked about. And then I'm going to show you one of those mind maps uh, <laughs> that pulls it all together. So how about that? Are you game for that, Steve? That is awesome. If you guys are listening to this on the podcast, it will be uploaded on YouTube as well. You can check it out there. But Minders, go ahead, talk to us, walk us through the framework that you have for us. Okay. So the framework is number one, plan before you implement. So plan your, your launch, your product launch, your marketing focus, your, your marketing campaign, and so forth before you implement, all right? And we'll expand on these. Uh, uh, number two is do a product launch uh, thoroughly and do it from the place of, of fitting into your schedule. So do it in, in your comfort zone, in your time frame. And again, we'll expand on that. And then thirdly, and this is a thing that is uh, pretty much unique to my approach to doing product launches. And that is that you have to focus on a, your long-term plan, getting really clear on your long-term goals and sequence product launches together in order to reach that goal. So plan, do an individual product launch implementing and then sequencing them together. Okay, so now building some layers around that, uh, let, me, let me tell how this, you know, came about. So back to the story where I, where I first year I was a project manager on this launch. And, uh, and what I saw was a herding cats mentality, you know, and, and I worked with Don um, the next year. I was not only his project manager, but I actually ran the launch. So I was his product launch manager and um, did a consulting uh, gig as a, as his, what we term chief of staff, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I kind of ran everything and saw all aspects of it and hobnob with him and, and all of those contacts doing the product launch thing. And what I found out universally was that there was a mindset in the product launch space um, that, you know, okay, we're going to do a product launch once every six months or a year, and let's gear up, let's put on our battle armor because we're going to war. You know, it's going to be tough, and the whole team's got to get ready for it, and for at least the three weeks before the launch, say goodbye to your family. We're going to be pulling all nighters and it's going to be hell. Right. And, and I go, what, what the heck are you guys doing? Right. Why would you do it that way? Well, there's kind of a badge of honor, you know, no pain, no gain. And, and I learned there's got to be a better way. Well, I think, I mean, to you, there's a better way. Your left brain, like you're, you are a unique combination of left brain, first with like a highly creative part that comes in, right? I think entrepreneurs, most entrepreneurs are so creative and they're so in their right brain. They're not laying things out. They're just like, I'm launching it. Let's do it. And like, we have a to-do list that includes things like, 
you know, write an email, do a Facebook post, write this stuff out on the whiteboard, wash the car, build a house, repave the driveway, fly to Europe and be home for dinner. And like all of those things make sense to us because we think that time doesn't do anything, right? We, we see the impossible and we do it. Whereas you, you see the impossible, but somehow you build a framework around it and you're like, oh, we're going to do this and then 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 we're going to go to sleep. And like, that's a new thing to entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's right. But you know what? You're absolutely right. So I not only say we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to do this, but I look for validation from my clients, you know, to see, did this work? You know, I mean, so I used to be a lot more on the worksheets and the, and the mind maps and so forth. And now it's like, okay, boy, I've got those over here, but I'm only going to introduce it based on the person's ability to incorporate it, you know? And so, um, and so the whole process is about one, everyone is unique in their ability to move forward at their pace. That's, that's what we have to focus in on. Awesome. So, so how did I make that transition? So what happened is um, in that, during that second year between project manager and launch manager for the following year, um, I created the entire team structure and time frame so that we had time to do it you know, easily within everybody's schedule. So we started earlier and, and we adjusted the non-essential and put these into the schedule as well. You know, because my belief is that if you incorporate this into your everyday uh, modality of running your business, then guess what? You're likely to do a launch again. If you don't, it'll be like, whoa, well, that was interesting, but I never want to do that again. And you can't get ahead unless you keep launching, you know? And, and um, I learned that uh, when I was selling Amazon products. You know, I learned that product launches go on all the time. And you're constantly introducing new products and, and changing your marketing to get more exposure to your products on Amazon, et cetera. And then I incorporated that into the product launch online world of selling info products. So the idea is, hey, you know, if we can accept that we're in a long-term process and all we have to do is stick with it and have a system that allows us to stick with it, then we can move ahead. Got it. And that makes sense. I mean, it, it's 100% true. If you know that you can do it and you know it's easy and you know you make money from it, then you're going to do it again. But if you did it once and it was super stressful and hard and difficult, even if you made some money from it, you might say, we're going to do that again, but it will always be, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We might do it tomorrow. We might do it next week. That's right. So, so the two principles come into play. You know, one is don't hit home runs. Um, hey, we're not just doing a product launch and burning out and then figuring out what's next. We're doing a planned out, purposeful, mindful product launch that fits into a bigger whole, a planned progression of a series of launches strung together that will achieve your long-term goal. So those are the hitting the singles component. And because we're not going to pull all-nighters, uh, and we're going to fit it into what our team is comfortable doing uh, and stretch them a little bit. We're being respectful of the people on our team. The very people we need as we expand beyond ourselves to working with others to pull this off. So that, you know, that's how we got to that three-part uh, plan or, or mm -hmm. uh, framework, which is, plan. So we're not just planning a launch, we're planning what the whole thing looks like looking ahead on the chessboard. And then we're taking that first step with a launch. And then we're adjusting and we're sequencing launches together. Are we going to launch the same thing to a different audience? Or are we going to go to our value ladder, which is our progression of products we can offer and launch something else, but they have to stick together. And so 
in order to make that easy um, to convey to people, I created a model. You know, they started on a mind map and went to uh, uh, a framework. And I'd love to share that with you now so that we can, you know, talk about how that unfolds. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Let me do that. Let me do that right here. And hopefully you're seeing the, uh, the graphic of the Momentum Launch Roadmap. Yep. All right. Go ahead and walk us through this. Okay. So the idea is uh, most people who aspire to great things online, you know, have this idea of I want to have a million dollar business, you know, a seven figure business um, online. And the reality is very few people can get there by doing one product launch. You know, it's a progression. And it starts off with us getting clear on what our product is and doing a beta launch, you know, where we do it to a few friends and people we know are interested. And then that grows and we get a big, little bit bigger following and we do an internal launch, you know, to our list and our social media. We get practice on that and then we reach out to affiliates and that's where the real leverage comes in. But you can't shortcut that success path. You can't buy affiliate relationships. You have to earn it. So the framework is this. Let's go through a planning process that you see here in block one. So there are three rows here. And the first one is the planning process that I've talked about. And it's about forecasting your future. All right. So what's involved in the planning? Well, it's defining specific long-term goals, which are financial and personal. And in the process, we don't want you to do pie in the sky. Hey, I want to have a million dollar business. You know, or I want to be the next, you know, market leader in this. It, we want it something that's, that's really specific that you can relate to, that you can emotionally ground yourself on. So we go through a process of determining what those goals look like. And then there is a combined process in the numbers two and three here where you really see what you're good at. You know, what do I have? What You take inventory of what is my, um, my thing in my background that I am uniquely qualified to share with other people. And, and you dial in that, you know, product offering, that, that experience, and the niche or the target audience to identify it with. Um, and while I'm on that, you know, what I want to do, um, it, just for a second, I'm going to stop sharing here. And I want to, you know, get in touch with something that you, you know, alluded to is like, you know, do, uh, can you work with just, you know, anybody to do this or do they already have to be online? And the, the, the interesting thing is the, uh, the people who have an offline expertise, they're a specialist already, you know, like they develop, they're a therapist or a one-to-one -one practitioner who's developed in their area of expertise a methodology that is pretty unique, uh, and they're good at delivering it one-on-one, -on -one, and they're confident in, uh, in delivering. So they have expertise and confidence, and now they want to go online. You know, so it's easier to work with a person like that who has the expertise, and then all we have to do is bring them through a process to bring it online that builds on it, then it is a person who has tried a number of things online, and, uh, and none of it has worked, and they're trying to figure out, well, what can I offer that is unique? Because they typically have a lot of stuff to overcome. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. I know all about that. You know, and, and so, I mean, we were in a high level coaching program where, where people took most of the people, hundreds took more than six months to get clarity on what it is, you know, they were going to offer. Right. I mean, if they ever got clarity, I know people, I mean, that, that program was two and a half, three, 
three and a half years ago now, three, yeah, uh, yeah. a long time ago. Um, but there are a lot of people in that program that still never, ever got clarity on what they were doing or where they were going or what was going on. They're still spinning. Um, so, th- I mean, that's a whole different thing. I think your process at the beginning. So anyone who, who right away says, well, my goal is to make a million dollars. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I don't think you are either, but bring that goal closer so that it's something you believe you can do in the next 90 days. And as much as we've all heard like the law of attraction and think big and all of that, think about what, I mean, I believe this is what you're saying. Pick something that you can really believe in and be like, I know that if I really put my mind to it, I can achieve this goal. And you actually believe it because if you believe it, you will take the actions. If you pick a goal that is too big or too far out there, I I always relate this to losing weight. People are like, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to go to the gym. It's going to be awesome. And they get out of bed really early and they go to the gym for four hours and they work out really hard. And then they come home and they're sore and they're tired and they're miserable. And they get up the next day and, oh man, I can't, I'm just too sore. I'm too tired. I can't do that. Well, I'll, I'll go for like, and they go to the gym and they go for maybe half an hour and they do one workout that doesn't hurt. Pick something that you can do, that you can move forward, that you can get yourself into momentum. And even if you just get your first launch, I mean, your first launch is about growing your list, about getting some sales, about proving that you can do something in the marketplace. It does not have to be a million dollar launch. It doesn't have to be a hundred thousand dollar launch. Definitely could be. But if you do, if you do 10 grand, if you do 20 grand, it's a success. It got you momentum. It gets you names on your list. So that's, I don't know, I'll get off my soapbox, but that's, that's what I hear you saying. And I agree with yes. it. So here's what I, what I found. Remember the example of, you know, online marketers um, who have tried things, given a little bit of focus, tried something else, you know, shift what they want to offer. They reinvent themselves, you know, constantly. I call that sideways marketing. And so what we need to do is to get people on a vertical trajectory, you know, Mm -hmm. into vertical marketing so that what they do builds on each other, you know, so that sure, if you're the type of person that needs variety, you can still have that, but you have to have an overall framework where the things that you're launching and selling, you know, make sense and they tie together so that you're not disjointed. And so that presented the next challenge, which is what I, I built the model for and the way that I approach things. And so that challenge was, how do I get a sideways marketer to believe, to become convinced that if they just focused on a long-term trajectory, you know, that, that they could reach their goal. And so, so let me show you the model again, and I'll show you what I came up with. Yeah. All right. So um, here we are uh, at the end of the first row in the planning area. So this item number five is about creating a three-year sequential projections. Now, there are four primary launch models um, that I, that I think that everything, every way that you can launch out there really falls into those categories. And, um, and some of, and those models are particular to the individual. You know, so some people won't do the traditional, uh, launch model where, you know, you go out to the world and you have, say, uh, a seven day period where your cart is open um, and you put yourself out there in a big way and bring on affiliates and so forth. Some people just don't want to gravitate towards that. Others want to gravitate towards more of a, what I call a roadshow launch, which is where you where you take it on the road, working with one affiliate at a time, give that affiliate and all of their people on their list that they influence, uh, you know, a solid week of your time and your love and attention. Um, And that fits their temperament a lot better. Some want to do something totally different, which is uh, to go completely pre-recorded, you know, and to do a, uh, a kind of like an, an um, on hold 
uh, or you know, auto repeat type of launch where they create a webinar and then you know, behind the scenes are running ads to it. And each week or month, they're, you know, running people to that launch. So, so the method to reach your goals are specific to your goals and to your style and your time frame. Uh, and so I've created a model in this number five mm-hmm. for each of those launch types and blending them where I can show how with your goals, how long it's going to take you to reach your goals. And, and that's where my CPA background comes in and my modeling, you mm-hmm. know, and I've had enough experience to know conversion rates, um, you know, and opt-in rates and, and Facebook ads results and so forth uh, to take a very conservative approach. And then when I present that to people and show them before they've ever done the launch that if this is your goal and uh, you want to put this amount of effort into it, uh, it will take you this long to get there. So some people can get there in less than a year. Some people, you know, might be in their third year, you know, to reach their goal. But I can quantify that with financial projections explained and shown in such a way that it makes total sense and it's tied to your individual goals. Then that, you know, by following this approach, you can get there. So awesome. what do you think that that does to people's level of motivation to then jump into block two, you know, a launch and starting into the program? Nice. I mean, I'm sure it gets them moving, which is exactly what they need to be doing, right? Um, exactly. So, so here, block two is all about the current product launch. So, you know, what we're doing is we're moving... Uh, we moved from left to right on the first row, and now we're going, you know, from right to left. And here again, the planning. We've talked about planning on a global sense. Now we're planning your first launch. So we know what kind of launches are in your toolbox that are that are tailor fit for you. You've bought into those. And now we're going to say, before you start implementing it, let's plan it out. So you mentioned earlier, I like for, for new people online, I love what I call a momentum launch, which is uh, one of those four models. It's the last one, actually, um, that uh, we've talked about the other three. And so the idea is it's two launches in one. It is the combination of uh, what we know as an unboxing type launch um, and a presentation launch. And you can do, there are a number of specific mechanisms to achieve each of those. Um, let's just talk about one for the unboxing, and that would be a challenge. So an unboxing launch is, is just what the name implies, uh, that you know how you get a package in the mail and you unwrap the paper and uh, inside is a box, like if you buy something from Amazon, inside is a box and in it are a number of smaller packages because you probably bought a number of things online. So a unboxing launch is that concept. And so a challenge does exactly that. You look to solve one particular problem of your audience uh, and in the process of doing that, um, you're off. You're you're convincing them that you're the person to take them to the next step, which is the bigger launch, mm-hmm. and that's your bigger program, and, and that you have a presentation or a webinar to deliver that. So that's what we do, and so you can see that in that combination of a challenge launch and a and a say a webinar launch, there are a lot of moving parts that are interrelated. You know, so not only do you have to determine what the components of your challenge are, but true to unboxing, you know, what are your upsell components going to be? What is your one-time offer and the other things you're going to offer? And so um, most people will tend to jump into that and hope that it all flows together because it's easier to implement than to plan. But if you plan, so you see how all of those things feed off of each other and build to the next thing, 
What happens is the result is you can actually implement faster. You can get into launch mode faster and you get a better result because your subconscious mind is already processing those things that you introduced, you know, right here uh, in section six of your planning process. Okay, creating that launch storyboard, which pulls together in outline and thought form all of the things that are going to be developed, you know, much deeper as you move through the launch. You know, and I've shared that with you, Steve. Yeah. Think of that process. Okay, so people, so what is the third step then? Like we move through the first, we move to the second where they're, holding their launch. And this is where I think it's really interesting, like where you're talking about, because I think a lot of entrepreneurs, like they've heard of the Jeff Walker launch um, PLF formula, right? And they're like, okay, I'm going to hold a launch. They're thinking it's one launch. Your whole genius in this is that it's, we're going to do one launch and then you're going to take a short break and then we're going to do another launch. Whether that is the same funnel, whether it's a different funnel, whether it's something else in the value ladder, we're going to do an internal, we're going to do another external, but because you're planning it, they can continue to do numerous launches until they just keep scaling. Correct. That's right. Exactly. So if somebody's thinking about doing this, if they're thinking about it and like they're still in pain, what's something that they can do to just start moving the needle forward? Um, so that, that's a, a great question. And, um, and the, the answer to that, you know, is, is just to be willing to do something different, what most online marketers aren't willing to do. And that is to stick with, to try something and stick with it and add layers to it until it gets legs and, uh, and builds you know, your long-term success. And that, that's the tie-in to step three. Um, and, and I'm just gonna show it real quick and then we're gonna be done with that imagery. Um, mm-hmm. But step three here, uh, after you've done your launch is that you evaluate your results and you move forward so that you've already got a plan. You've already seen how sequencing can work. Um, And so now you see, wow, you know, my results were either less or better than the initial plan for that first launch from the sequencing. Now let's adjust the model with real data and see how to move forward. And then we can see again, are we at a trajectory to move there you know, faster or slower. And so that's where we take all the data, the, the KPMs, the, the key performance metrics from the first launch, and we adjust it, you know, to, to start launching again uh, and to launch again as quickly as we can. So that's how, you know, the, the whole thing comes together in that you are quickly internalizing a launch mode and you can have several things going on at once, you know, a uh, one that's on autopilot as well as, you know, your main product that you're going to do say every quarter, you know, to go, reaching out to affiliates and doing a roadshow launch, you know, in the interim to sharpen the saw. Awesome. I love it. So we've walked through what somebody can do to get started with the launch. We've kind of walked through the different phases of a launch. What is something that you see a lot of people in the online space do wrong or something that you see another guru talk about that says, you know, do this. What's something that people should avoid at all costs? Um, Well, I'm going to be pretty radical in in what the answer is. And, uh, and I know that you probably wouldn't, wouldn't even expect it. But the idea is uh, avoid putting your focus on building your marketing influence and your list in front of putting your product or services out there. So I'm saying flip that. Now, how about that? I mean, that's a pretty radical idea, right? So you're saying develop the product first 
or to at least develop the idea for the product and get it into beta. Um, exactly. So, so what I'm saying is that the best way to build your business is by taking the work to plan a launch that will not only pay for itself, but in the process, you have to build your reach. You have to spend money on, on advertising uh, in order to have the launch be successful. And then as a result of that, bam, you have a greater social media following, you have the start of a list, and all of that will build upon itself. All right, so awesome. let, me, let me expand on that just a, yeah. just a little bit. Um, so last year, I did a virtual summit with this exactly in mind. Um, and I uh, came out of the summit. I, I uh, created a budget for, for this launch before the event. And I saw that um, in that event, I needed to spend money on advertising to get the audience, but that uh, the results of what the pricing was for the summit you know, and the upsell program at, as a result of it, that I would come out ahead above my advertising. And so I was willing to go ahead and take that risk because the downside was, was actually low. There was a fair amount of upside above, you know, the, the advertising cost. And mm -hmm. I built just on the organic part of that, I built my list by a thousand people, bam, in three weeks because I had a focus of where I was sending them and a tangible result. And now all of those people had the result of that outcome, that launch. They either bought, you know, the, the virtual summit, the result of that launch, in this case, a challenge, or they had seen the marketing material and I had built up that no like and trust factor such that they were open to further marketing methods. And so I'm saying, you know, do, a planned outcome approach where you can budget in your ad costs uh, to get a you know a better than um, break even outlay. You know that in the process you're out there, you're making money, and you have something to build on, and you've built your list in the process. Awesome. Sorry about that. My uh, my Google alert was going off. Um, I think that that is, I, I think you're right because there are so like just touching on like the people that get obsessed with the list. Yes, you need a list, but build a list while you're building the product. And what you just laid out is if you do the launch correctly, your downside, yes, it's going to cost you some money, but your downside is very manageable and your upside could be huge. You're going to make money while you're building your list, which is what you want to do. Because if you just spend money building a list, but you don't have a clear thing that you're selling or a clear place that you're taking people, it's going to be a waste of time all the way around. Um, exactly. And, uh, and there's, you know, there's a related thing about this. And, and we have a mindset typically that advertising uh, is a is an outlay is a necessary outlay, and so there's a perceived risk of can I make enough revenue to, um, you know, to overcome that. Well, the answer is yes. You know, the goal is to have your your uh, advertising pay for itself, and so that you actually make more money from than you spend on your advertising in the campaign that you're using the advertising for, such as a Facebook ads campaign. And so what better way to do that than to have an offer that has several components so that in the combination of the things that you're offering, if at first your ads are costing you money, you add something to that offer so that it now becomes profitable. Then you can start to scale. So that's where the model scales, getting from a break even to how much money am I willing to put in advertising, even though I know that I'm going to make more money on it. And that's your biggest limitation. And so people go from, I'm going to try maybe a thousand dollars, but wow, 
I made more money than I advertised. So the next launch, I'm going to try maybe $5,000. And then before long, they've got $80,000 in on the launch and have made a million dollars on the launch. That's awesome. I mean, that is a really good way to look at it. That way you're not blowing all your money at once. I mean, we both know marketers who have maxed out their credit cards, taken home equity lines, like really spent a ton of money before they had anything proven, before they had anything going. And the thing is, like, I'm going to be real for a second. If you were to somehow knock it out of the park on your first or second try, you wouldn't be able to handle it because do you know how to onboard a team? Do you know how to deal with do you know how to deal with $300,000 in sales? Do you know how to deal with that much in refunds? Do you have a merchant account that can handle it? Like build up, like it, it doesn't mean that this has to take years. It could, it, a year to two years to grow a list to a size that can do a $100,000, $200,000 launch. I mean, if you're doing a $100,000 launch and you're doing it four times a year, that's a pretty good place to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can get there a lot quicker than you might think. And it's, you know, the turtle approach, the turtle beats the hair all the time. Awesome. Well, minders, I know you have a challenge that teaches this and gets people started with it. Where can people go to learn more about you and about the challenge and about launches in general? The best place to go is to my website, beyondproductive.com. And there you'll be able to learn about, about me and uh, the, the Momentum Launch Catalyst program and the challenge that we have. Um, and you can even book a discovery call with me, a free 45-minute session to see if what you're doing lends itself to this approach. Um, so beyondproductive.com. Awesome. Well, Minders, thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us. Um, I always love chatting with you. I know that you shared a ton and that anyone listening to this definitely picked up some usable information. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks for having me, Steve. No problem. To all of you listening out there, make sure you go check out the show notes. Go visit beyondproductive.com. Check out Minders stuff. Definitely take him up on the free call. You will get a ton of value from it. I always learn something when I talk to Minders. So until next time, everyone, take action, change lives, and make money, and we will see you soon. Bye, everyone. Are you looking to scale your business but trying to figure out how to get your message across? Well, go to storyselling.how to grab my free course that will show you how to discover everything that you need to build your business through stories. These stories work whether it's in social media, email, or public speaking. There are five core stories that you'll learn. You'll be able to use all of them by the time you're done with this course. Again, that is storyselling.how. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to tune in next time.